In this video, we see RAF aircraft dropping CHAP or window as part of their radar countermeasures program. In addition to CHAP, the RAF and U.S. bombers will be equipped with electronic radar countermeasure systems. The intent of this video is to review bomber radar jamming electronic equipment, tactics, and effectiveness in disrupting both German early warning and gun laying radar. This is the channel's fourth video deep diving topics related to German flak versus Allied bombers. The other three videos are shown here and reside in the channel's flak playlist. So far, we've covered German flak tactics, chaff as a radar countermeasure, and flak suppression by attack. The eight tactics bombers can adopt to reduce flak's effectiveness are listed on this page from a declassified 1945 ADI report titled German flak. Item D lists countermeasures to confuse or defeat enemy gun laying radar. Radar countermeasure systems adopted were either passive, like chaff, or active electronic jammers like carpet. Germany adopted a robust overlapping early warning radar system as shown on this map identifying coastal radar stations and coverage as of June 1944 from a declassified 1945 headquarters AEAF air staff document titled Operation Neptune. As discussed in previous videos, the Germans usually had ample warning of approaching bomber fleets. Characteristics of German radar systems are listed on this chart from a March 1945 Air Intelligence Group document titled Japanese Electronics. The columns represent the radar name, size, deployed height, frequency, range, and use category. The Freya and Giant Würzburg radars were used for air search early warning. The small Würzburgs were used for anti-aircraft fire control. Images of each of the German ground radar systems. The Giant Würzburg and Pol Freya are adopted mainly as early warning radars, whereas the small Würzburg is used for flat gun laying radar. This image shows a Giant Würzburg with an IFF antenna array located at the top of the radar. The Pol Freya with the lattices consisting of transmitting, receiving, and IFF sections from an April 1945 War Department document titled Directory of German Radar Equipment. Images of the small Würzburg gun laying radar are shown. Two IFF antennas are located in the disc here. Characteristics of the small Würzburg are shown on this page. The radar was designed in 1936 and used for anti-aircraft fire control, searchlight control, and ground control. Control of the radar's position is by manual hand wheel crew inputs. The disc is 10 feet in diameter. Practical range equated to 25 miles when adopted for flak fire gun control. Additional specifications of the small Würzburg radar are listed on this page from a June 1945 naval intelligence document titled German Aid to Japan. First use was in 1942. The radar provides aircraft range, elevation, and azimuth. These parameters will be fed into the gun laying director. The radar projects a beam at 17 degrees. The frequency can vary from 470 to 590 megacycles. Accuracy equates to 11 yards in range and 0.2 degrees in direction finding. German radar technology lagged behind the Allies, as discussed on this page from an August 1945 Headquarters Air Material Command document titled Where We Stand. At the end of the war, the Germans were at the same state of radar technology as the Allies were in 1942. They never thought microwave frequency was possible until inspection of salvaged radar systems from down U.S. and British bombers. They expended large resources in trying to mitigate the effects of Allied radar countermeasures. The German radar mostly operated in the 50 centimeter wavelength and concluded shorter wavelengths to be impractical. The Allies developed high fidelity 3 centimeter radar. This page describes electronic radar jamming from a February 1945 Assistant Chief of the Air Staff Intelligence report titled Impact. Flak has a more detrimental effect on bomber crews and fighters. Both carpet and chaff reduce the flak hazard. These radar countermeasures have reduced losses during blind bombing missions. This image represents a blind bombing mission where target sighting is by a Pathfinder bomber. Electronic jamming or carpet scrambles the radar return. These jammers are tuned to react with the German gun laying small Würzburg radar frequencies. The jammers are tuned to frequencies one megacycle apart for best results. Even in clear weather, carpet will reduce the effectiveness of the gun laying director in ranging, as a German flak battery will need to rely solely on optical tracking. 
Up to 90% of the small Würzburg radars are tuned to the 560 megacycle band, although the frequency could vary between 525 and 595 megacycles. Barrage jamming is like firing a shotgun covering a wide frequency band at low power, while spot jamming targets a specific frequency at higher powers. Advantages and disadvantages of radar spot jamming are discussed on this page from a 1992 Duke University Department of History dissertation titled The USAF and Electronic Warfare, 1945-1955. to All of the bomber's radar countermeasures jamming power is concentrated on a specific frequency. The jamming signal is likely stronger than the ground radar's re reflected return. This will blot out the radar screen. Spot jamming is limited to a small bandwidth of frequencies. Multiple spot jamming systems would be needed to react to all the radars. Radar spot jamming systems require trained operators. The Würzburg radar may switch frequencies. A trained electronic countermeasures operator would need to adjust his equipment to account for any radar frequency change. A barrage jamming system, on the other hand, sends a wide bandwidth signal at a lower power. Actual radar frequency is not required, but a large strike force of ECM jammers are needed to cover a large frequency band. The bomber's radio operator will need to turn the system on and off. Enough bombers are needed to cover the expected frequencies at sufficient power. Overlapping radar coverage is required. A few missing frequencies may leave gaps in the radar coverage which would render the efforts wasted. This chart illustrates the differences in coverage between spot and barrage jamming. The scope return of an unjammed and jammed radar from a 1945 Office of Scientific Research and Development document titled Electronic Warfare, a Report on Radar Countermeasures. The bomber's transmitter and blade antenna are shaded. This video shows a B-29's electronic countermeasures blade antennas. This page lists bomber modifications that occurred throughout the war from a 1945 8th Army Air Forces Evaluation Board document titled Tactical Development. All B-24 and B-17s except Pathfinders are to be equipped with two carpet barrage jammers and 12 aircraft from each group to be equipped with spot jammers. A group is roughly 36 bombers. Field installations occurred in the spring and fall of 1944. This modification is required to jam German gun-laying radar. Supply issues forced delays and modifications to this plan. Carpet-equipped bombers flew their first mission in October 1943. The losses for carpet-equipped bombers were half that of those without carpet. The 15th Air Forces also deployed carpet-equipped bombers. Chaff was first used in conjunction with carpet two months later in December 1943. Carpet radar jamming systems were added to every bomber. Carpet and chaff proved to be very effective when used together. This table lists a U.S. carpet jammer designation and name, frequency range, spot jamming frequency width, and power output from a 1988 Air Command and Staff College report titled Electronic Combat Over the Third Reich. Electronic Countermeasures Equipment Naming Convention is described with this example. AN signifies Army and Navy. The letter after the slash indicates the platform type, where A is aircraft. The next letter is the type of system where P is radar. The next letter is the purpose of the equipment where T is transmitter. And the last number is a series designator. This page describes radar countermeasure jammers adopted by the 8th Air Force's heavy bombers. Radar countermeasures were expanded during the last part of 1944. By early 1945, electronic warfare was extensively used against German radar. 75% of the 8th Air Force's bombers were fitted with two APT-2 barrage jammers. The frequency was preset prior to the mission based on updated weekly electronic intelligence intercepts. Bombers in each group carried the APQ-9 Carpet-3 spot jammers and an ECM operator. Six spot jammers could provide equivalent or better results than 18 barrage jammers. The APT-2 barrage jammers were selected to jam Würzburg radars. Initial shortage of the jammers limited only one system to be installed on each bomber. The system's range was limited, so all bombers needed to be transmitting to be effective. Specially equipped planes were used to monitor the Würzburg radar frequencies for tuning on the next missions. Large-scale carpet countermeasures started in October 1944, when sufficient jammers became available. Once enough jammers were available, two APT-2 barrage jammers were installed on each bomber.
This chart illustrates the frequencies of German ground radar and corresponding U.S. carpet jamming ranges. Early warning giant Würzburg and gun laying small Würzburg radars operate in this range of frequencies. The APT-2 carpet barrage jammers can be tuned to this range and power settings and the APQ-9 in this frequency range and power settings. This page from a February 1945 Air Technical Services Command document titled Graphic Survey of Radio and Radar Equipment outlines characteristics and components of the AN APT-2 jammer. The system is an aircraft platform radar transmitter barrage jammer. Transmitter output frequency range is between 450 and 710 megacycles. The frequency is preset prior to takeoff. A bomber crew member will just need to turn the system on and off. It can be adapted as a spot jammer, however. A trained ECM crew member will be needed to operate the system. The effective range is 7 miles from a giant Würzburg radar. Transmitter output power ranges from 4 to 8 watts. The bombers will be field modified including two antenna mountings and a radar transmitter box. Each bomber was fitted with two systems. The system weight equated to 60 pounds. This image illustrates the barrage jammer in action. All bombers are equipped with barrage jammers. The jammers disrupt the giant Würzburg early warning radar and gun laying radar. This rare image shows the radar jamming antenna attached to a B-17. This page outlines characteristics of the AN APQ-9 Carpet 3 radar jammer. The frequency range is between 475 and 585 megacycles. It can be used as a barrage jammer but is mostly used as a spot jammer. It can disrupt giant Würzburg radar scope returns at a range of 6 miles. The ECM operator changes jamming frequency by turning a dial. Noise signal power can vary from 10 to 20 watts. The system includes a rectifier power unit, radar transmitter, and two antennas. The system weight equates to 115 pounds. The radar transmitter space dials, gauges, and switches. Radar electronic jamming lessons learned are listed on this page from a March 1945 15th Air Force's document titled Flak Attrition Analysis. Complete German radar jamming can be obtained by the application of 30 to 35 APT-2 barrage jammers and several spot jammers or 16 to 18 APQ-9s in service as barrage jammers plus several spot jammers. Barrage jammers cannot be tuned in the air and a single unjammed frequency would render the bombers vulnerable. With radar frequencies covered by barrage jammers, spot jammers can increase protection by multiple factors, but the barrage jammers must completely saturate the radar frequencies. ECM operators seek out and spot jam enemy radars operating outside of standard frequencies. It would be impractical for spot jamming radar to fulfill the work of barrage jamming. There should be a balanced distribution of both barrage and spot jamming equipment. A good balance would be for each bomber group to have four spot jammers assigned. A bomb group is roughly 36 airplanes, so one out of every nine airplanes would be equipped with the APQ-9 spot jammer and carry an ECM operator. The remaining 27 bombers would be fitted with two APT-2 barrage jammers. No extra crew members would be required for the barrage jamming equipped bombers. However, the radio operator would be responsible for turning the jammers on and off. So how effective was radar jamming in reducing bomber flak losses? This can be addressed through several sources. German flak officers in Italy indicated that carpet rendered their Würzburg fire-controlled radars useless, especially when shaft was also used. In certain cases, the radar countermeasures were so effective, no flak rounds were fired. If they did fire the guns, they resorted to barrage targeting, which consumed large quantities of ammo and reduced the flak's effectiveness by an order of magnitude, as compared to continuously pointed fire. An Air Force memo stated that radar countermeasures were as critical to the bomber against flak as their guns are to fighters. RCM equipment was to travel to England by the fastest vessel possible. This page outlines post-war interrogation interviews regarding the effectiveness of radar countermeasures against flak batteries from a 1945 document titled German Flak. Radar jamming became significant in October of 1944. Chaff was an issue in October 43, but was overcome somewhat. Active jamming with carpet rendered radar returns useless. 
If the radar could not direct the flak guns, no firing occurred. The Germans could detect the presence of jamming equipment at ranges of 15 to 21 kilometers from the small Würzburg sets. Radar countermeasures were extremely effective, as discussed in this 1945 Headquarters United States Air Force in Europe document titled Minutes of Flak Conference. Chaff and carpet rendered unseen continuously pointed fire inaccurate or impossible. Even in clear conditions, radar cannot be used to measure the bomber's formation ranges. Radar countermeasures necessitated flat gunners to switch to barrage fire, which is one-tenth the accuracy of continuously pointed fire. During the last six to eight months of the war, the intensity of bomber radar countermeasures was so effective the Germans believed the radar battle was over, chaff radar scope noise was too high for any returns, and the electronic carpet countermeasures forced Würzburg radars to operate at their limits. General opinion is that chaff was more effective than carpet. Both were detrimental to radar operations, even on clear days. Post-war interrogations of German flak personnel leads to this conclusion. Radar countermeasures reduced Würzburg-controlled gun-laying radar by 75%. This equates to a savings of 450 bombers. In summary, Germany was two years behind the Allies in radar technology. Electronic radar jamming carpet was adopted by heavy bombers in addition to dispensing chaff. These systems were as critical to combating flat flak as bomber gunners were in combating fighters. By the war's end, the bombers were fitted with two APT-2 barrage jammers, and some of the group's bombers were fitted with the APQ-9 spot jammers, plus an electronic countermeasures operator. The radar countermeasure systems of both carpet and chaff are responsible for flak bomber loss reduction of 75% when the guns were radar directed. This equated to a savings of around 450 bombers. Did any of the data surprise you? If you've enjoyed this radar jamming presentation deep dive, please consider engaging with the video by commenting, liking, and or subscribing to the channel World War II U.S. Bombers.